Hoo-dee hoo. Hey guys, welcome to episode 80. Uh, I just want to give a quick disclaimer off the top. I haven't really said a whole much, said a whole lot in the beginning because I just, especially these light, latest ones have been pretty long and I just want to get to the conversations right away, but I want to throw a quick disclaimer. My voice is a little jacked up in this uh, podcast. I mean, I guess it sounds a little better right now, but uh, no, uh, my hormones did not finally kick in. Um, if you were wondering, I don't know what's wrong with my voice. I feel fine. Just my voice is shitty and it's all scratchy. <clears throat> so, um, and if anybody wants to uh, just a check up on Bullet, he did lay here through the entire interview uh, as a good boy for the most part. And I think he left at the last 15 minutes, probably said enough of this conversation, but, um, but yeah, it's a very powerful conversation. I really enjoy her and we, 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 you know, like I said, we talk about a lot of things that are super important to the world and, uh, just kind of the whole basis of what this podcast is about and, and, and a lot of struggles that people are going through and just kind of just some, just putting out some information. That's all. Just, you could take it for however you want, good or bad, uh, agree or disagree. Just listen and, you know, maybe you can apply it to your life in some way, shape or form. And that, and if it helps somebody out there, then we did our job. So, all right, guys, uh, welcome our next guest. All right, guys, so we're here with uh, another episode, and again, I like to tell you where I find these people because I actually have to research and try to find people, but in this case, um, as I said many times, uh, Podmatch has been kind of a godsend because um, every uh, if you get the free version, you get like five searches a week, and I always search basically the same keywords mainly like disability, disabled, and homeless, and stuff like that. Just keywords, and I use up my five out of the way. I mean, if I got the paid version, you can you can do a, you can have unlimited. But I don't use it that, that much, and since I have so many guests as is, I don't really, it's not like I, I'm desperate to find anybody, but if I see someone that catches my eye, I will definitely reach out to them. And uh, our next guest, I did do that, and or she definitely caught my eye. And, uh, you know, I was doing just reading her profile, and then we had a couple conversations off mic, um, we got to know each other, and she actually got the last guest for us, and uh, that was really nice of her. And uh, like I said, she has a really great story and an impactful story. So, uh, why don't you just tell us, you know, your name and obviously a little about yourself? Hi, thank you so much for having me on your broadcast. This is exciting and a great opportunity, and I really admire and appreciate what you're doing for uh, the the disabled community as well as just the world at large. I think. Um, we need more positivity and um, mutual understanding. So I really, I really appreciate it. Yeah, so my name you. is Sarah Shalom. Um, I am uh, at the moment primarily um, a writer and um, sometimes a speaker. Um, and most of uh, what I put out into the world um, right now has to do with what I call the three ins, which are integrity, intention, and inspiration. And I, I mean about a couple of those words, a little bit different than what most people think. So I'll just explain quickly. When I say integrity, what I mean is um, the ability to really just come to terms with who you as a unique individual were designed to be, um, who the truth about yourself, right? And then with intention, we take that knowledge about who we uniquely are designed to be and we put it into practice just on a moment to moment basis. We try to do things that align with who we are. And my hope is that by me doing that and that by others doing that, we can simply offer inspiration and permission to other people to see that that's possible and to make the decision to maybe include those things in their own journey. So what I have in common with this podcast is that I have, um, I've had a number of uh, physical and other kinds of setbacks in my life. And, you know, I was wondering about how to mention that on your, on your podcast and how to explain that. And just recently I've had a really radical internal shift about how I'd like to tell my story about those kinds of things. So mm-hmm. maybe I can kind of say it the old way and the new way. Okay. Um, the old way is that um, I grew up with a lot of um, trauma. Um, there was uh, various sorts of uh, abuse and, and different um, major incidents 
that uh, happened during my formative years, which affected me emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, and physically. Um, that led to um, different kinds of um, mental health diagnoses and struggles for years and years. I was told, um, but, well, clearly I had a post-traumatic stress disorder, and I was also told um, that I would um, be um, clinically depressed for the rest of my life and that I would always require interventions and, and medications for that. Um, I developed fibromyalgia um, early on and then uh, a succession of other physical uh, complications, um, including, um, well, most recently I've had two spinal surgeries in the last six months and I've also been diagnosed with um, a functional neurological disorder, um, which makes my um, abilities from day to day wildly different. So, so when it rains, it pours. That's kind of what I had been leading with, and just you know all this stuff from the past and how it how it has um, brought about the problems that I have to try to overcome day to day. But as I've been um, convalescing, especially recently um, from my most recent surgery. I really decided that I don't want to tell my story that way anymore and that I really don't want my present or my future to be defined by the setbacks in my past. Right. So I'm really kind of seeing myself as in the intermission of my life and I've been thinking a lot about what the second half will look like and how it will be differentiated from the first. I can already say that the doctors were wrong. Um, about my um, mental health diagnoses. I have, I've done very hard work, um, but I have radically overcome that chronic depression and those um, active symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm really, in many ways, moving physically beyond my, um, what I was told would be lifelong physical challenges. I am by no means perfect. I have by no means arrived, and that is absolutely okay. I take it one day at a time. But I'd like to really be able to make decisions about my present and about my future based on hope, and um, trust and faith and knowing who I am as a person on the inside and what I'm capable of rather than the things that have been taken away from me. Right. You know, that difference between acceptance of my situation <clears throat> and resignation to my situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, and I think what mm -hmm. a lot of people don't really talk about a whole lot when it comes to having a disability is that there's many stages of actually dealing with it. I think a lot of people just think like once you get diagnosed and a month or two later, you're like, Oh, okay, I'm disabled. Like that doesn't work out that way. I mean, a lot of times people are just mm. numb for months to, to years. And then of course it all depends when you get diagnosed. If you're diagnosed as a child, then you kind of, you live with it and you're just, that's your, that's your normal. But then there's people that get right. diagnosed with things halfway through their life. Um, I was four when a lot of happened to me, but a lot of the depression and a lot of the other stuff that came was when I was a teenager. So um, and so for, like I said, for a while, you kind of go through these stages of, you know, un, you know, you, you can't believe it, disbelief. And then grief, yeah, it's and, the stages of grief. And then grief yeah. comes and then you, you know, you're sad about it and you're angry about it. And then you mm -hmm. hope to get, you know, and then some people of course are so depressed that they, you know, take their own life and all that. But the ones that actually, <clears throat> excuse me, that can make it on the other side of it. Um, I mean, I don't know if they ever fully, fully recover, but you know, it takes a really long time to really come to terms with it. And then it also depends on your age because, you know, we're now of age. I don't know. How old are you? I am 45. All right. So you're 45 and I'm 32. So it's like, you know, it takes, and again, I'm not saying it took 45, but it, it took a long time, I'm sure, for you to really, because again, more information comes out, the medical, you know, all the, all the technology and everything that comes out. So everything is, you, you get you can spread a little more light on everything that comes out and then and, and you just don't, um, like I said, you don't even have all the information to begin with, depending on, you know, what you were, or, you know, what decade you were born. So there's so much right. that kind of goes into just being, um, disabled and actually like living with what you have because, you know, like fibromyalgia, like it's, it's a known condition, but I don't, I wouldn't say it's like broadly, like everyone knows about it because I mean, we know it's a chronic illness, but I mean, how much do people know about fibromyalgia other than, you know, what, 
you know, maybe one celebrity said they had it or, or whatever. But um, so, like I said, it, you know, and that's why it's important to do these type of things because you got to put the information out there because, you know, how many people like you are suffering from, you know, I mean, even just the depression stuff, but the fibromyalgia and all the other conditions, the back surgeries, everything that you have, how many people have that? And, and you know, like I said, a lot of people are walking around and people don't even know what they have and, and don't even know anything about it. Um Right. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, there's a difference too, though. I would say between suffering with something and acknowledging that something is a part of your physical reality, but or your mental reality or whatever. But having that only be a circumstance, an informing circumstance in your life, you know, to help help guide your your um, so you don't burn out, for example, or things like that. But not allowing it to define you. That's right. been part of my process with um, both the diagnoses of um, fibromyalgia, which I've had for years, as well as the neurological um, disorder that I was more recently um, diagnosed with, is that both of those tend to have stigmas attached to them that um there are some people who, even medical people, who will say they're entirely psychological, right? Or they're they're entire, you know, it's all in your head, or you know, because you can't or you haven't properly dealt with your trauma or your mental illness or whatever that it's manifesting in physical ways. And that's a horrible way to come at these things because you're basically blaming the person who is struggling with these things for their struggle, and then that just exacerbates the the condition right. so it's really important to surround yourself if those are part of of, of your um, life story you know with um, professionals as well as um, supportive people who understand better the physical mechanics of those things and not that you shouldn't be treated holistically I truly believe in the mind body spirit connection um, and I, I think that that's something that's really lacking acknowledgement in, in Western medicine. But also, when we put the blame on the person who's struggling with a disability, that's not going to help the disability get any more manageable or improve at all. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, especially because, yeah. you know, again, I've always said like depression and all that comes with it. And so a lot of us, depending on what stage we're in, you know, mentally we're dealing with it. Um, if you start putting the blame on them and you start making it like it's their fault. And a lot of times life can feel that way because, you know, there's plenty of times, you know, just, let's just say applying for jobs. Well, they're going to make mm -hmm. it seem like, oh, well, well, you're great, but we can't really have you here because I mean, they won't I mean, it's very subliminal. They're not going to tell you that because it's technically discrimination, but you know, they, they're going to basically make it seem like, oh, you're great for here, but you're, you know, you're a liability. And, and you know, there's a lot of things that are kind of mm. pointed at you to where you, you don't know how to deal with that because it's like, oh, like, oh, I guess this is my fault. Like my eyes, wow. or, you know, your yeah. back problem or whatever. I can't lift this or I can't do that. So that that's my fault. And, and it's not at all. It's just a system that's really not made for a lot of people, uh, but especially people with disabilities. Right. I've been thinking a lot recently about um, the difference between the terms disability and differently abled, you know, disabled and differently abled. And I know that to a lot of people that could sound uh, just like semantics or, you know, trying to put rosy cheeks on something. But I think differentiating those terms, at least in my own mind, is really important because when I think of myself as disabled, what that's saying is there's a laundry list of things that I'm not able to to do and it defines me by the things that I lack you know rather if I think of myself as differently able that means I do have a laundry list of abilities they're just not the same as maybe mainstream the mainstream population has you know what I mean which in a way is a superpower if my abilities, I mean, that's what superpowers are, right? <laughs> is, is having completely different abilities right. than other people. I often think about um, people who, I mean, certainly you understand this, who, who, who their um, different abilities include not being able to, say, see or hear or something, and that what happens is that you... I don't like the word compensate, but I can't think of a different word right now, but you... you um, 
you learn to expand your other senses, right, beyond what most people have. If you can't see, maybe your hearing is really super good or your sense of touch or something that you notice things that normal people don't because you don't have something that they have. Right. Has that been your experience? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just part of what you were saying as far like yeah, because I'm not a huge word person. I don't know. I, I go back and forth with what words to define it. Because again, I don't like the word disabled because it basically means we don't work. And um, mm. you know, because I've always I always looked at it as like I remember playing some old video games and you know part of the mission is like oh you got to disable an alarm and I'm like oh that's just kind of one letter over disabled disabled oh uh-huh. no, okay and it doesn't work and it's like yeah a lot of people think we don't work and again in some cases. My eyes don't work. So in some cases, people's legs don't work or their ears don't work or whatever. So it's kind of applicable, but it's also one of those ways to kind of another label to kind of put us down more than we already are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I struggle I struggle with it because I'm not a word person because I feel like we have to have real conversation with each other. And I think we get to a point where we have all these words that we take out of our vo- vernacular and we, and we just take away from the dictionary and all that because – uh, you know, a long time ago, there was a conversation about, you know, what now people call the N-word. But, of course, people, they wanted to have a um, a funeral for it. And it was like, okay, no one can say this word. And it sounded great on paper, and it's adorable. But um, the guys who created South Park, they said, hey, it's either all or nothing. You either take out all the words or you take out none of them. Because as soon as you take out one, everybody's going to want their word. And of course, then gay people came with their word and, and, and everyone and everyone. So it gets to a point where it kind of convolutes the conversation and we never get to the real arguments where it's like we're so stuck on don't call me this. And we never really talk about all the things that are really the problem. And I'm not saying it's good to just call someone special needs retarded or anything like that. But when we get when we get stuck on words like that, I don't know, like I said, I think sometimes the argument gets like kind of just watered down more than it is like one of the new things i've discovered is Mm. that a lot of people on instagram who have disabilities there's a lot of people fighting for like all these little subdivisions of the disabled community where it's like i see a lot of black women that are fighting for inclusion for black people in the disabled community and i'm not saying that's a bad cause but when you start to do that it's like disabled people aren't included as it is so now if you take it if you cut another you know corner off and you say, now we want black people included. So then gay people are going to be like, well, we disabled gay people aren't included. And now women aren't included. And it, it's already so segregated it's from the blind to the deaf to the paraplegic. And no one is together as it is anyway. So now if you start cutting off the race and the gender and all that, it's like we are so far from actually sticking together. And we're stuck on these words and all this inclusion instead of just going, hey, yes, black people should be included. Gay people should be included. And I am one of those but they all should be included with me, not a, I just want what's best for me. Um, mm. And so, yeah, I kind of wanted a tangent there, but you know, so yeah, I know. But as far as, yeah, my experience with it, it, it's, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's very similar to what you were, you were saying. Yeah. I appreciate you saying all of that. Let me clarify a little bit in, re- in response to what you said, um, something really important to me. I'm not so much talking about, um, caring about how other people define me, but rather how I define myself in my own mind, you know, so that I'm not um, having internal psychological blocks um, to, to the, to the, first of all, the joy and peace I could have in my own life. And and second of all, to the impact that I could make in the world. You know, there's one thing that I've really learned through, I guess I didn't include in my original introduction of myself that um, a huge part of my story is not just, it's not just, oh, bad things happened to me and I suffered because of it. But um, as is often true in, in stories that especially start out with a lot of trauma, after I was out of the traumatic situation, I took over for my abusers and I became um very, very self-destructive. And I put myself and other people through a lot um, because I was, I was replaying my trauma is is a way to say that. And something that I've learned um, in my process of um, uh, becoming my own friend and nurturer and ally rather than beating myself up in various ways, very literally um, and figuratively um, 
is that the only person I can control is myself. It's that, um, like they use in 12 step groups, um, the, the serenity prayer, you know, that says, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, to change the things I can and the courage to know the difference. Right. And I've, when I look back, I can see that each time I have tried to micromanage what everybody else thinks or does or wants, um, especially related to their perception of me, I go crazy really, really fast, you know, and I start to make really unhealthy decisions. But when I release all of that and I just focus on who am I going to be and, you know, kind of like I'll go back to my three ends because I always do, you know, who am I? And according to that, what should I be doing today to, to align myself with who I am? And then just allow that to be out in the world. And if that gives permission to other people to kind of let go of their baggage and do the same, great. And if they're not ready to do that yet and they need to keep stirring the same pot in their own lives, then, you know, they're not ready till they're ready. But right. it keeps me a lot more sane and more productive right, right. When, I, when I don't get caught up in everybody else's chaos particularly in the ways that they try to make it bounce off of me does right. that make sense yeah and and, and kind of what you were yeah. saying there in the beginning it's just like to me just the whole superhero thing just you know you kind of have to be trapped in darkness for a while to actually see the light like not to be cheesy mm. and religious or whatever but you know the people that are already kind of given that light and already see it but as soon as they you know come out of their mom's womb and it's like Oh, everything's great. It's like those people don't understand. They don't appreciate life like we do, like at least not on the level that we do, because, you know, when you go through trauma, you go through pain and, and, and not just physical, but mental and emotional pain. And you could come on the other side of it. You can really appreciate so much more about life. Um, and you see what so many people are lacking in life, too, where it's like for me having a vision problem, I see so many people take their eyes for granted. And it's like, I have mm. some sight and I've worked with and I have friends that are blind and I appreciate the sight that I have. I don't, I don't look that I, like I'm better than them. I just say, oh, I'm very appreciative that I'm not, I don't, I don't like to say the word privilege because a lot of people throw that word around now and it makes it, it, it and I get, I guess it makes it, it's, it makes sense, but I hate that word now because it's just become a word that like, it makes it like, you know, oh, you know, you have it easy type of thing. And it's like, I've never had it mm. easy. So uh, anyway, um. But yeah, you know, like I said, you know, that's a really great point, though. I you made me think of there was a time when um, a man I met, a, I, I got to know a man really well, um, just a friend of mine. And and when he after we had known each other for a while, he learned some of my story. He said, I should have known. And I said, why? And he said, you are so joyful and you are so at peace. He said, it's his experience that people who are that way have often been through the most horrifying things, right. you know, and, and that really struck me, but it also strikes me regularly that sometimes, and I don't mean to be nasty, but just, just to kind of agree with what you're saying, sometimes I see people, you know, like what has been commonly called lately, you know, being a Karen or something like that, which, right, right. you know, is unfair to people named Karen, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, these people who get really bent out of shape about the teeniest, tiniest things. Right. Whenever I see that happen, I always think to myself, the first thing I think is, wow, you must have had such a privileged, easy, lovely, and I don't mean it in a sarcastic way, you know, but you must have lived such a blessed life if such a little thing can make you go from zero to 60. Yeah. Wow. You must have never really experienced profound hurt or challenges in your life because the people I know who have really experienced profound hurt and challenges and choose to get up and try again the next day, little things don't ruffle them like that. Right. But it is a really quick way to kind of distinguish sometimes. And again, that is kind of a superpower. You're right. Yeah. And that's why I've always been about togetherness because the disabled community, it doesn't matter what you look like because the, if you're disabled, it does, you know, like the same with addiction and homelessness, it plagues all those communities. It doesn't matter if you're black, white or gay or transgendered or any of that shit. And that's mm -hmm. why I always hate when people, and I shouldn't say hate because I understand the sentiment behind, Oh, I want women to be more empowered in the disabled community or gay people or what I understand it. I really do. But if you don't start reaching out to your neighbors and you don't start trying to come together and actually say like, okay, yes, 
it would be nice if women were more included more in some posters for people with disabilities. But at the end of the day, it'd be nice if people with disabilities were included at all, regardless of they were mm. white, gay, but it doesn't matter. Like, let's just start with something. I, I, you know, honestly, just, you know, I've, you know, I've also noticed even like some of the places I've worked, you know, they like to have the blind people in front and not the visually impaired people because they're, you know, you'll feel bad for them more. And it's like, no, like, yeah, like it's how you exploit people. And the reality of it is like, I don't mm. give a shit what your disability is. I don't, if your disability, cause I, I do feel that mental health is a disability, which some people don't. And it's like, I don't care what your physical, mental, whatever it is, just, you know, look out for the person next to you. You know, like when I was watching, I bring it up all the time, yeah. but that documentary Crip Camp, there was something so great in that documentary where, you know, people were trying to figure out how they, cause they were stuck in these, these like offices trying to get these uh, laws passed and they were like, well, they only let a few of us in. How can we communicate to the people on the outside? Well, the deaf people mm. in, that were in the building say, we got this. Hey, you tell us what they said, and we'll sign language it out the window. And someone who can read sign language out the building can pass it along to all the people who can read sign language or who can speak, you know, who can you know, convert it. And then all the people out there who are in wheelchairs and, and on crutches and whatever else, they could pass it along. And that's how they know the progress that's going on out there. Like that's just complete synergy. That's people wow. working together and coming together for an actual real cause. Um, and that's why I feel like so many things nowadays are just, it's frustrating that there's not enough people like you just constantly pushing the envelope. Because like I said, it, it, it doesn't matter what you look like. We get stuck on color and, gender and all this other shit and like i said i'm not saying it doesn't matter in some in some worlds it does but if we just continue to just separate the community more than it already is and it's sad because we have 1.6 billion or 1.8 billion of us and we we can't actually have a real and not an army because that you know that sounds like you're gonna get physical but if you, you don't have like a real coalition together and just you know unity you can't make much of a difference and so, sure. you know, like I said, that's, that's, and then, you know, again, back to the privilege thing, it's like, that's something that gets thrown out of people. You know, it's like, well, you're privileged that you have some sight. I, like, I guess I get it. I get, you can say that to me. I, I understand that, but I hate that word because it's, it's an oversaturated word now, even like the word racist, like mm. it's, it's an oversaturated word. People just say you're racist, no matter what you do nowadays. If you say one thing that's even remotely out of context or anything, it's like, well, you're that like labels get thrown on people and it's I'm a person that's had labels on me my whole life so it's like I, I push back when they try to throw more on me um sure and so you know like I said that's that's why the whole purpose of this podcast is just to have real conversations with people I don't give a shit what you look like and that's why you know I've, I've looked through the, the 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 guests and all the people I have on and there's not one person that's really similar to each other you can't say like my demograph is white people or or even disabled people, because I would probably say most of the people that listen to me are probably not disabled. Right. Because our community is so hard to You know, to reach. that's a great thing about your mission and about your message that I've noticed consistently is that you work hard to be inclusive and to identify the things that we have in common and how that's a strength rather than the things that separate us. And that's that's cool. It's funny. You said I'm pushing the envelope and, and I, I see why you think that and, and why it comes off that way. Um, and I think that maybe my past self would look at me now and see that too. But the beauty of um, continually doing my own inner work um, is that what looks to the outside, like pushing the envelope, is just really me naturally growing and joyfully blossoming and doing what seems like the next best thing, you know, when we, when we put the pressure on ourselves of how is this going to come off to other people or what are people going to say about me or that, that, that can make us wash down and, and be editing ourselves so much that it's right. like we're, I mean, to, to use a word a different way, you know, we're handicapping ourselves, you know, and our, and our potency. But I can also say, you know, I'm really liking this superhero analogy one thing that has been a gift before you before you go on I just wanna, and I, sorry yeah. i just want to add one thing um no because I, I, I when i say that you are i don't i think it's a natural thing like even when i and you could promote the instagram and all that or your youtube later and everything but you know i watched that youtube video where you're breaking down your three ins through lion king and it's like it's a very it, it, 
no one would ever look at it that way, but like you're, you're simplifying it and you're making it so people understand it, but on, on a, even on a story that everyone knows and loves, uh, it's not like you, when you're pushing the envelope, you're not like, you know, shoving it in people's faces. You're doing it in a very humble, just like really nice, sweet way. Um, I think some people can be some people. Yeah, of course. Like some people, you know, I think I'm way more aggressive than you are. Like you, I get frustrated. I get, you know, I, get, I, I, you know, I try not to let it get to me too much. Um, cause I honestly, I, a lot of times I get more frustrated with our own community than I do sight mm. you know, able bodies because I already know what they're going to bring to the table. I already know what a lot of the able bodies are going to try to do to prevent us, but it's, it's us that get in our own way. But you know, just back to you. Yeah. Like mm. I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't even know if it's an intentional thing. I think it's just, you're, you're just a natural person who wants to help and kind of put it out there yeah. and, and, and you're just, yeah, I don't, like I said, I don't think it's anything that you're just like, you're writing down, like I'm going to say this or do this. It's. It's just kind of who you are as a person. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that because I actually even forgot that video existed. And I just thought of the thing. And then I was like, oh, that's something to share. And I was just completely rambling off the top of my head, which I usually do in my <laughs> videos. <laughs> yeah, but I'm it's, glad it, it comes across well and it's not convoluted. So no, thank but you. if you know the story thank of Lion, you. you know, the Lion King, which is, you know, probably the greatest animated movie ever existed. And, you know, you don't really <laughs> think, especially you know, we mostly watched it when we were younger. And so I honestly, I don't think I've seen Lion King in 15 years and it made me want to rewatch it again. Cause it is a great movie regardless of your age. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the only movie I could really watch what actually has a lot of music in it. Um, but beyond that, oh, like, yeah. but it's just like you, when you break down the whole story, like you don't really think of all like the adulthood type of analogies and, and, and euphemisms and all the things that are in there, you can really take for the rest of your life. But we just look at it like, oh, a lion got thrown off a cliff and, you know, the sun had to take mm -hmm. over and, you know, he takes over and spoiler alert, there you go, movie's over. Like, you know, it's, he, he makes a couple friends along the right. way. They kind of guide him to, you know, be getting back on the path of being the, the king of the jungle and that's it. But the way mm -hmm. you broke it down was very intelligent. And, and so, yeah, like I said, I, back Thank to, you. I just don't think, I don't, I don't think it's like phony and all. I think you're just trying to, you, you, this is just who you are, at least at this point in time in your life where you're just... Mm -hmm you know, when you're pushing the That's envelope, true. it pushes the envelope, but it's just, it's just a natural, like, Oh, I'm just an honest person. This is how I feel. And you take it for how you leave yeah. it. Well, and a great thing about that before I go to my other point is that this is something I'm learning more and more, especially as more and more people become aware of who I am and everybody feels like they need to put in their two cents about what they think. And it's not always nice, especially when it's not directly to your face. You know what I mean? Is that, when you get a strong sense of who you are, so, and which is what I call integrity, you know, and you, and you make peace with who you are and you align your choices with who you are, it's so much easier to blow off just plain nastiness or, you know, people who are just determined to misunderstand you or whatever and not need to feel um, like you need to defend yourself or something because there's really just that, um, well, I guess I said it, you know, right in the first place, you know, there's that piece about yourself. You're like, okay, well, you know, that's where you're at now. This is where I'm at right now. Let's keep moving forward. But the thing that I was, uh, that I was going to say as we were talking about the superhero thing, um, related to having different or, um, removed abilities from our lives, um, as a metaphor, I'll tell you, um, way back in 1994, pretty, pretty soon after um, the coup in uh, what is now Russia, I went on um, a trip there for two weeks. I actually turned 18 there. Um, and uh, the family that I was staying with there, the mother in the house took me shopping for just some basic things that they needed. And it was a radically different shopping experience than I had ever had in the United States, as well as just living, you know, in um, an apartment home with a family and just seeing how things there were. It shifted my perspective on how things can be in different parts of the world. And when I came back to the United States, um, I went into, um, I don't know, it was like a Myers or a Super Walmart or something like that. And I literally I, I had just a full-blown panic attack just walking in and seeing all of the choices there. And I actually felt like I wanted to vomit and I had to leave. And it took me a few weeks before I could navigate the number of choices available to me in stores in the United States after just a short period of 
of um, experiencing a different way of, uh, of living in, in another part of the world. And the reason I bring that up is because for so long in my life, I was my, my, I was completely just halted in my life by an excess of choice. I had so many interests and so many things that I wanted to do. I became um, terrified of making the wrong choice because I thought if I choose one thing or one or two things, then I'm saying no to all of these other things. And what if they were the right thing? And I had this really strange idea but that, that I think a lot of us have that there's only one right path in your life or you know one thing you're meant to do and that you have to discover it and do that thing or your life was misapplied right or you failed at life and and that just kept right. me from doing anything for a really long time I would just sit there and do nothing because I was so afraid of doing the wrong thing and the strange well, they make it like yeah. it's just like it's always it's only you know you got door A and got door B, but no one ever brings up door C or D or E. It's like you know, right, and chances. I had like you know door triple Z in my head, and I was just panicked. I was panicked about it, right. and um and, and in a lot of areas of my life too. Like I I heard so many philosophies about the right way and the wrong ways to raise your children, and everybody who says that their way is right says all the other ways are wrong and are going to hurt your kids that I became absolutely paralyzed as a parent because I thought no matter what I do, somebody says it's going to destroy my kids. You know what I mean? That just um, glut of choices and opinions was overwhelming for me, but a gift of some of the choices being taken away from me. I often, I think in pictures a lot, I often imagine, um, some of my my disability it's like this big cosmic cat just knocking stuff off of the table <laughs> in my life you know okay. what I mean it's just like no screw that thing and forget that thing and right. a gift of those things being removed without my consent from my life is that my focus has been narrowed to the things that I still can do and the things that I can lean into and become really excellent at, which has really helped me to gain traction and momentum and to have an idea of where I'm going in my life rather than just sitting, you know, wringing my hands and going, what if it's the wrong thing? So many of the things that clearly weren't meant for me were just removed. And that is a gift and has become in a way a superpower for me. Yeah. When you know what you don't want or what you can't do, that helps you to know what you do want and what you can do, whether or not you're the one who decided what is or isn't possible. Does well, that make sense? Yeah, I mean, and we're we're very we're a lot like computers. Like you really need to just kind of, if you have a computer and and you know you have I don't know, let's say uh, you know some type of sort of uh, you know malware software, and you're just you know for viruses mm. and you get you got to do a whole scan of your body and your mind and. I mean, that's part of meditating is just scanning your body and seeing what was aching and, 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 you know, what is just irritating you, but also just mentally right. just kind of go through your whole body or your whole, like just life. And, you know, I remember being in therapy and just talking about my dad one time and I just went on a rant. I just started shitting all over my father and just going, and again, I hadn't mm. thought of him and not even just thought of him. I mean, I would, you know, every once in a while he popped in my head, but I, I never really addressed it to anybody and then it just came out in therapy and I wasn't, I didn't think I was hiding it. It was just one of those things where it's just like, I had so much going on. I just didn't feel like addressing it or whatever. And it came out and I was just going at him and I'm just like, man, like, I think this should have been something I should have addressed a long time ago. And I was, yeah. cause I realized I was so angry about it and it's, it's kind of like, you just got to cleanse it. I mean, not to gross people out, but you kind of need like an enema for your brain. You just got to cleanse everything mm -hmm. out of your mind and and, and, you know, and again, there's some stuff and it's probably just going to linger and whatever. And, you know, again, you can't forget all and there's certain things in your life. You'll probably never forget um, good or bad, but you just got to get to the kind of the root of everything and realize like, what are the problems? Because, you know, one of the big things that everyone tends to do is they try to, you know, before they really take the onus and actually say, you know, you know, again, back to the 12 step, you know, one of the number one step is to, you know, realize you have a problem. And if you just mm -hmm. think everyone is the problem, you know, like I, one of the things I get mad about with people with disabilities, we tend to try to blame people who are able bodies acting like there's nobody out there who are fully functional and they're not great people. There's plenty of them. And, you know, some right. of them we live with, you know, our caregivers, our doctors, you know, there's our family members, whatever. Um, 
And so we got to realize what our problems are first before we can even try to detect, you know, and again, we, we got to kind of get past what are the, the hurdles and the problems because they're going to be there, especially if you have a disability, hurdles are just going to exist. So um, you kind of have right. to just get to the root of all your problems. And then, you know, once you kind of realize like, okay, my problem is that I, whatever, I procrastinate and I do this, I do that. And then you kind of real try to find ways to solve it. And, um, you know, I right. think you, you got to realize that you're never going to be perfect, but you got to try to find a way to get as close to it as possible. And again, you'll never right. get close, but if you can constantly improve yourself, you know, I think, you know, especially when you see these older generations, like my grandma is so stubborn. She won't fix anything in her life. I love her to death. She's 89 years old. She's very healthy and she's going to outlive a lot of people that I know, but she's so stubborn with so many of the, her, her way of, of just going about her life. It, it's very, very frustrating because I'm a person that really, again, and maybe part of it is I'm also just, I'm, I'm hard on myself and I'm never good enough or whatever type of ordeal. But I also always try to better myself, whether it's my mental health, my physical being, you know, I'm, I'm considering cutting out caffeine altogether in my life. And I've been drinking caffeine my whole life. Um, but it's something that's it would have never crossed my mind 10 years ago. Um, and it's just, you yeah. try to better yourself because there's a lot of shit out here that's just, you know, polluting your mind and, and your body and, um, not to be preachy, but it just is. And you gotta just do research and you gotta, you gotta start with yourself and you gotta, you know, work your way down. You gotta care about yourself. You gotta realize what problems you have. And then, try to get some tools to fix it. And then, um, you know, like, I mean, like look at love, like I'm a person I'm single. I've been, I'm always lonely and frustrated, but one of the things I've kept trying to fix is to fix that void by just throwing any girl into that void, that hole. And just like, here you go, you'll fix mm. it. And then it's not because I don't, you know, yes, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with wanting love and, 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 you know, being a decent guy who's loyal and, you know, yes, you can be a good guy out here or be a good woman out here, but it doesn't mean you're going to just, automatically attract people like you because you're one of those people, because you're, you're an easy target to be taken advantage of. And if you have, you know, with me, I've learned to get tougher skin and try to be, a, a, you know, I don't want to be too hardened to the world because that's when you start to just don't let anyone in, but you have to really, you know, you have to have a balance. And so you can't just yeah. fill anything with just, you know, Oh, it's, it's a person. It's a body. It's, it's whatever. Yeah. It sounds good on paper. Oh, she's nice. Yeah. It's not going to work if you don't really take care of yourself, because if you're not mentally right. or emotionally ready to, you know, get into something, it's not going to work. So, yeah, I mean, exactly. right. Knowing your own worth is really important. You just said so many good things. I'm trying, I'm actually jotting down a couple of notes here. So I don't forget what you said. <laughs> you know, you were talking about your grandmother and that, that uh, reminded me of, there was this um, book, I don't know if you're familiar with, there were these really popular children's books uh, a couple decades ago called The Berenstain Bears. Oh, yeah. yeah. And one of the yeah. first books um, was called The Bike Lesson. And it was written in um, rhyme. They started out written in rhyme. And there was only the brother bear, the boy bear. And um, the, the he gets a gift of a bike from his father. And he goes, oh, can I ride it? And the dad's like, oh, no, 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 no. First, I have to show you how to do it so you don't hurt yourself. So there's this series of um, events where the father keeps going, okay, here's what you do. And then he completely botches it. You know, he ends up in a tree or, you know, being chased by bees or in a lake right. or whatever. Right. And each time that happens, he tries to pretend like he meant to do that. You know what I mean? Right, and yeah. so he says, he there's this refrain of, this is what you should not do. Let this be a lesson to you. Right, right. And I think of that a lot. And I think, you know, each person is actually inspiring other people with their choices. The difference is some people are inspiring others by going, wow, I'd like to make similar choices and have similar outcomes in my life. And then there are certain people in our lives that stand as examples of where we don't want to go and who we don't want to be. And that can be equally blessing and useful if we're willing to take in, in a non-judgmental way, those lessons. It's like I tell my kids, I have, I have five uh, just about grown children, and I tell them all the time, I do not expect you to make any of the same choices that I've made or to believe the same things that I believe, but I am going to share candidly about where I've been and where I am now and why. And I would like you to take that information and make informed decisions. Life's too short to make all the mistakes yourself, right? Learn from somebody else's or from their triumphs. 
And if you can learn anything from my life, including I never want to be like you, then okay, I've served a purpose in your life. And that's really good. But also, you know, with what you were saying right now, I have been behind the scenes. I guess it's the first time I'm saying it publicly. I've been working on um, a bigger writing work um, related to resentment and um, shame um, informing that too. And that really informs a lot of what I write about anyway, even when I'm not coming at it directly. Um, And shame and resentment really do. Earlier I was talking about the mind, body, spirit connection. And, And while I stand by what I said earlier in our conversation about how it's not useful to blame people with disabilities for their disabilities, at the same time, If we're not willing, like you were bringing up, you know, to do that inner work and and to recognize, oh, my gosh, I am holding on to bitterness and it is literally becoming a part of of toxicity in my body that's coming out. It's manifesting in physical ways. You know, for example, just really simple examples. Your neck hurts all the time because you're clenching your teeth because you're trying not to say all the nasty things Mm. that are in your mind, you know, Two much bigger examples, you know, that if we don't do that inner work and we only treat the symptoms in our lives, that we're not ever getting to the root of what's causing us the discomfort and dis-ease in our lives, or what at least is making it harder, the things that are completely out of our control, like being born blind or something, you know, that can be more or less of a disability depending on our attitudes about it, right? And and what we tell ourselves we can and can't do, or um, if we choose to blame um, other people or ourselves or God for our situation or, you know, whatever, that those things are really, really intertwined, not to blame anything for any circumstances, but the more we can root those things out in ourselves and the more we can take responsibility for our own attitudes and the ways that we frame the things in our minds, you know, in our thoughts, create our beliefs, create our actions, create our experience, you know, that the more our experience can change. Right. Yeah. I mean, like what you were saying, like I, every person I've ever come in contact with good or bad, probably that, that I can recall have, have made an impact on me. And I've always looked at it like, look, Mm -hmm. every good person has some bad in them and every bad person has some good in them. So you can take what you want. And look, like as I said, I love my grandma, but she has certain qualities and she's also old school. She's 89 years old. She's born in a different time. There's a lot of beliefs and things right. she has that I don't agree in. But my grandma is 89 years old. She walks a mile a day. She, you know, she does it. She cuts her own grass. She sh- shovels her own snow wow. or snow blows. Wow. It. But, and again, people will say, well, why don't you take <laughs> this stuff from her? It's like, dude, if you take it from her, she's going to just say, put me in a home and anything she asks yeah. for, I'll do it for her. And I have, but she, she has all these great qualities and she's, she's a very strong, tough woman. She's independent. She's an, you know, like I said, she's a woman who, when her husband was dying and he had MS, he was 300, almost 300 pounds. She's maybe 110 tops, very skinny, slender Mm. woman. She took care of him. She bathed him. She got him into his wheelchair. She did all these things for him. And that, that, yeah. And that strength, it, it, it resides in me in, in other ways. Um, and so, you know, I again, and then I take the bad stuff that I don't like about her and I delete it. And I just say, okay, I love this part about you. My friend Lori, when she died, there was qualities I loved about her. And she, she, she was in my life for maybe three years, but those, those three years still haven't, you know, dissipated in my mind. I, you know, I told her story on here and, you know, the qualities that she, you know, gave me, I still bring to this day. I, I literally carry on. I feel like part of my life is just to live more for her. Um, and so, mm. and so that's, again, like I said, there's plenty of people that have come through my life. Even when I wasn't great with me, me and my dad were on the greatest terms. He did teach me when I was a kid that when it comes to like guns, he, he was a hunter. So he would always have guns in his safes and stuff. But once in a while he would leave a gun unloaded on a table just to kind of tempt me to see right. if I would play with it. And he, and I'd always run to him and say, Hey dad, you left the gun out and he would put it away. And it was just a, you know, and stuff like that resonated with me. Even if I didn't, if even if I was at my heyday when I hated my father, I still remember those type of lessons that he taught me as a kid. So, mm-hmm. you know, and again, so you get to a point now when, you know, we're now in our adults and we know kind of who we are and, you know, kind of where we're headed, at least for the most part. 
you kind of take all that for good or for bad and all the people, and then, you know, that's how you kind of develop to be a great human. I think everybody wants to try to be this original thing, but I don't know if they're, especially, I don't, there's really nothing that's original anymore. Everyone just, you know, every idea is kind of from mm. another idea. It's just, you make it your own and, and, you know, look at music, you know, right. no one, you know, right. love has been talked about a billion times. It's just the sound of it. It's original. When you hear Adele, mm. you know, her voice is her vocals are so much stronger than most people and just how she per, you know puts it out there to the world it just sounds different even though the subject matter is the same so right. you know it's just you got to try to own it and make your own thing it's like you know what you and I are doing isn't original it's just we are our mm -hmm. own people we're our own character now we you know we live in the confines of you know we know who we are and you know we're we're good with that and we we've owned who we are right. and so that's kind of how you yeah, again, like I said, back to just kind of owning who you are and figuring out all your problems. And um, But again, realize that, you know, look through your entire journey and go, okay, I met all these great people, whether they're family, friends, enemies. And you realize, like, a lot of the things that you are, um, even celebrity stuff that you get from whatever, you pick up on and you go, like, okay, I want to add that to my repertoire, to my toolbox. And then you don't even know you're really doing it. You're just doing it. And then someday down the road, you're saying a saying that you never came up with. You just heard in passing. And you're like, oh, okay. Oh, I, I, I use right. that because of that person. So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of right. how you evolve in life. Yeah. You know, you touched on something that is just, I'm so glad you did because I want to tell you this, one of the most radical life-changing shifts in my life happened when I changed my perspective on one thing. Um, you know, I used to qualify everything in my life about myself, about other people, about circumstances. Things are either good or they're bad. They're either blessings or they're curses. You know what I mean? And you said something that made me think of each quality. You use the word quality a couple of times. Each quality that can exist in us is like a two-sided coin, right? You could It, it could be stubbornness on one side and tenacity on the other and that so many things about ourselves are really just tools which are either constructively or applied or misapplied so like for example a hammer can be used to build something or to punch a hole in a wall right or a fire can keep people warm and alive or it can burn down a forest yeah. and when I finally decided to stop, and it took me quite some time to be able to do this fairly consistently, and I really needed to work on it, but to stop qualifying everything that happened to me and everything that everybody said and everything that I did as either good or bad, and rather started looking at it just as information, just neutral data yeah. to apply to the next circumstance, my life radically changed. I became so much less um, emotionally all over the place and I became, I got so much more courage and I got so much more of a sense of humor and ease about myself, right. you know, so that I could go into situations and have it go however it goes, right? You know, I do whatever I do and it turns out however it does. And then I can step back afterward, like a scientist analyzing an experiment and going, okay, this is what happened. This is what I did. This is what happened as a result of that. Yeah. How do I feel about that? Would I like to experience that again? Or would I like to change it up next time and keep adding to data? You know, okay, this is something I'm observing in another person. This is how it's working for that person or how it's not. This is how I think it would feel to me to do that or not. Apply to the next situation. Kind of like Dr. Phil always says, how's that working for you? You know what I mean? Right, yeah. That when I started to look at things more neutrally and stop having to feel some way about it, you know, feel good or feel bad about it, everything got easier and everything became um, even more, not everything, but many things became more like a game in my life. You know what I mean? I, right. I stopped seeing things as um, wins or losses. Yeah. I, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it just completely shifted. That's right? a big thing. And in, in every right. aspect, it's just you're so focused on who won and who lost. Even just like, even with sports, where literally the meaning is to lose or to win. But sometimes we, then they look at people's legacies and they break it down. It's like, well, he's not as good because he lost 
all the big games. But it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, but he got you to all those big games. That doesn't count for anything. And he did put up these stats and right. these stats, and especially you know, in that case, it's a team sport. And you're looking at it as one, you're breaking down one person's character and say, well, he's not as good as that person because that person did this and that. And so, yeah, you got to kind of know right. like what you say with the tools. Like you got, you have these tools and you, you got to know what you, you know, also the responsibility. Like you said, you know, a hammer could, you know, go through a wall. Well, you, you know, you got to know what qualities you have and, and what the responsibilities of. Like I know now, like I never, you know, someone had told me one time, I was, you know, one, you know, a couple months into doing this, like, well, you're a disabled advocate. And I had to think about it because I didn't think I was because I didn't think I did enough or I put enough time in. And I've always kind of advocated for people right. with disabilities. It just was never on a big stage or, you know, in front of a bunch of people. But I would always stick up for people or whatever that were going through something and being discriminated against. So um, and so you got to realize, like, you know, like just responsibility. What what's the responsibility of what these tools that you have applied to yourself? You know, you got to know. Especially with me, I'm on these platforms where I'm speaking and it goes out to the world. And regardless of how many people hear it, I know that my voice carries to some people. And I know if I just get on here and just start, you know, bashing, let's just say people with sight or or able bodies, it doesn't look good because it just look, you know, it's just giving people, you know, I might fuel a a whole coalition of people just like, yeah, screw all them. And it's like, no, like I got to remember, like my, my voice the more people listen to me, I'm when I started off 10 people and now it's a few hundred. So it's like, if I just start mm-hmm. saying this and that a couple people may hear me and take that as yes, we need to strike back or we need to do it's like, no, like these are tools. You got to know how to use them mm-hmm. properly. Again, they can either go through the wall or they could just punch the nail in. You got to right. just cause you have them. You also got to know the responsibility of it too. And you yeah. know, and again, you may have take a quality from someone and they may have misused it, but you recognize that it was a good, it's a quality nonetheless that can be exploited in a good way. But if you, the way they used it was improper. So you take it and you go, okay, this is how you use it. Right. But if you, you know, again, if you go by example, you could misuse it just like they did. Right. I remember years ago, my um, little brother who, who has now passed on, he, he said to a group of people and, and he, he meant it. Um, as a nasty thing at the time, or, or to kind of discredit um, uh, what was being said. But um, we have a lot of uh, kind of charlatans in my family, I would say, you know, people who are good at um, BS. And, and he was acknowledging that by saying um, anybody in our family could sell ice to an Eskimo. Okay. And, and he meant it as a nasty thing. And it's not until fairly recently I thought, you know, there's a strength in there when, when applied with integrity, you know, and, and not, you know, to, to hornswoggle people, but you also brought up a great point or your glanced up against a great point in, in what you were just saying in that I think it really matters in our lives. Who's not whose opinion counts, but how much personal stock we put in different people's opinions, right? Like should a football player care more about an extremely unhealthy person chain smoking and eating pork rinds and yelling at them from a couch right. about what they should or should not be doing, or should they put more stock in what their coach says they should or should not be doing, right? right? And that sometimes we can get so wrapped up in the opinions of, I actually just found out this week that someone I have never met or interacted with was um, spreading some really ridiculous um, rumors about me. And I actually, I laughed when I heard what was being said because I was like, well, clearly we have never met. (laughs) You know what I mean? But years ago, that would have completely melted me down and I would have felt like I needed to do something about it and track down that person. And every person they've spoken to and defend myself and now I can go okay you know whatever I mean like why should that why should that get me off track about my idea of myself or my worth or what I'm doing you know it shouldn't that that opinion really doesn't matter and it's clearly more about that person than it is about me and I don't mean that at all in a nasty way but a neutral you know in a neutral way you know but there are people who know me well and whose life choices and personal ethics ethics I deeply respect. And if they were to have things to say about me um, in a in a in a uh, in a way that suggests that maybe I should consider changing, I'm going to give that 
way more pause yeah. and way more weight. And I'm going to really sit down and think about that. And who knows what conclusion I'll come to from moment to moment. But different opinions matter at different times to different yeah. levels. And if we can't parse that out, we're going to feel crazy and like we're chasing our tails all the time and we're never going to produce anything of value in our own lives, let alone for other people. Right. Just as an example, I was a couple of years ago at work, there was a rumor about me that I was gay because I don't, I was wearing, I guess I was wearing, I, there's, I have like two pink shirts. So I wore a pink shirt to work or whatever. And I, and I, but that wasn't even that. It was that I kept like my, my guy friends, I would throw my arms around. My one guy friend was completely blind. He didn't have his cane with him. So I was just guiding him around, but I was like, I have my arm around mm-hmm. and we were just kind of just bouncing around and whatever the hell. And it was just like, Oh, what are you doing? And, and, and it's just like, I didn't even let it phase me. Cause it's just, and then I, I think another thing was that, cause I do work really hard, but I wear gloves. So I keep my hands soft because I like girls and girls, you know, you give them a massage. They kind of like they have soft hands. So it's like, Oh, but it, the manliness of it's like, well, you have soft hands. It's like, yeah, you have scaly hands. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Like, I actually took care of my hands. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, hey, you do you and I'll do me. Well, and if you back up, you can look at those and see clearly the people who said those things have some questions or um, hang-ups around their own ideas about masculinity, right, or about sexuality. You know, and when we can step back and see that, like, where is this coming from? Is this really coming from my, my boyfriend often says when he sees someone just like completely falling apart and ranting either in person or online or something, he'll kind of jokingly say, who hurt you? (laughs) You know, but there's, there's truth to that hurt people hurt people. And when I see someone just out of the blue, losing their mind over something, I have to go, okay, there is something more going on here than what's on the surface. And besides the gift of releasing me from getting upset about it, that positions me to be compassionate and possibly impactful in that person's life. Because if I can meet that judgment or that tirade with patience and grace and kindness, that disarms people. You right. know, that's not what they expect. They, they're ready for a fight. And when you can say, tell me more, or when you can say, why do you ask? Or when you can just meet them where they're at with, with kindness and respect, whew, that can change a person's life. Well, with you that incident, I, mean? I was just nonchalantly dismissive and just kind of just sarcastic about the whole thing. I just, I, I, in a way, just kind of made it worse. Just really just started hugging my guy friends and just being weird because it was just, at that point, it was just like, I know I'm a very loving, you know, just an affectionate person. So I'm kind of touchy and I like to just, you know, sure. let people know I care about them. You know, even with my friends that they don't have yeah. a lot of money or whatever, I like to, you know, sometimes to say, hey, you know, you know, if I got some extra money here and there, I'll make sure you have this tool or that and but again, I'm just, I'm genuinely just like, an, you know, even with doing this podcast, I try to keep in touch with everybody. It's hard because the more I do, the more people I meet. And, um, but I try, yeah. to, I try to genuinely care and try to reach in. And so with just that incident alone, it's just like, yeah, I'm a very affectionate person. So it's like, if, if, if someone looks at it as that, it's like, Hey, that's on you. I, I you know, maybe yeah, years ago that probably would have bothered me like, no. And I would have probably tried to overdo it and, and, and really like, yeah, see, look, look at this picture. I was kissing a girl like or something like but now it's like, I don't yeah. really care. Like I, and again, I'm not right. going to sit here and act like I don't ever care what people think about me. Cause there's people that I love. They could hurt me if they want to, because I love them so much and they've gotten past the threshold of my wall that they know if they're, they're, they're so far beyond the wall that they, they could definitely hurt me by doing something that probably the average person couldn't. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, and again, that's why you have to have tough skin because being, you know, being disabled in this world or be, having a disability or whatever word you want to use, if you have thick, if you don't have thick skin, life's going to be very hard to you and you're not going to be able to take it because you're, yeah. you're going to get kicked around or, a lot. Or at least a sense of self, you know, in a, in a, that, that it, you just, it just can't, it can't derail you. You know what I mean? I, yeah. sometimes when I hear tough skin, I think that that also means that we can't feel the good things. No, yeah, Let yeah, me yeah. tell you another really great lesson that I, that I learned, um, kind of early, thank goodness, early, um, in life, I, uh, in undergrad, I found out at one point that people kept asking me, like coming up and going, I've heard this about you. And I heard you did this. And I heard that. And I would be like, where are these ridiculous stories coming from? And I found out that there was someone hosting parties 
um, that was among, you know, in my friend group that I was not invited to. And that at these parties, they were spending a heck of a lot of time talking about me and just completely making up stories. And at first I was really upset about that and I wanted to do something. And then all of a sudden I started laughing and I thought, I just pictured how these parties must be going that, you know, they get together and, and this was the conversation I imagined, you know, one person saying, Hey, what's up with you? Oh, not much. What's up with you? Oh, not much. What's up with you? Oh, not much. I hear Sarah has a wife. (laughs) And And even though what they were saying was wrong about what I was doing, what occurred to me that day and has helped me since that day is that, and I don't mean this in a nasty way, but that people who spend most of their time and energy talking about other people don't feel like they have anything of quality to say about themselves. And beyond that, they don't have things that they're interested in of quality to have an even more elevated conversation about, like we're having right now, you know, about life-changing things. And it helps me to have... Pity is the first step, but then compassion, you know, for people who really all they can do is um, talk about shallow things about themselves or, um, you know, make up stories or sling arrows at other people who aren't at the table, Mm -hmm. because that's really a very sad and small place to be. And I don't mean that in a nasty way. That is a sad and small place to be, you know, and I can be grateful um, that that's not where I am today. You know, and I can, um, when appropriate, um, engage those people in a way that invites them, you know, to have a more elevated um, view of themselves, first of all, um, and um, view of what's really important, second of all, at least by my example. Um, And then they're going to do what they're going to do. But I'm going to move on and not get wrapped up with trying to micromanage that because I don't have time for that. I'm too busy doing cool things. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, exactly. You know? Cause I'm, I'm so big on like people. Like, I, I, I try to put my mind in any, like I, I try to take anyone's mindset and try to see where they are coming from, regardless of how horrible it is. Um, you know, I was mm-hmm. accused one time in school of, you know, I could have been the, the, the white kid that would have shot up the school because of, you know, I had a lot of anger mm-hmm. and rage and I, I think we talked about this and I, and I said like, they, they weren't mm-hmm. far off, even though it was hurtful. It wasn't far off because of yeah. all the pain I was going through and so on and so on. But that made me think later right. down the line. And I was also molested in school. And it made me think of, yeah. okay, if, and that only happened one time. And I, I, I could put myself in these young or these people that maybe were molested by their family or a teacher or someone. Yeah. And then they're now supposed to go into society as a normal person. And now they want to act out by doing what they did what someone did to them, whether it's bullying or, or, you know, molesting or whatever. And so I don't immediately write people off. That's why I'm so open to, okay, yes, this person's watching child porn. They haven't, they haven't reenacted it yet. It's still gross, but can we try to help them? Okay. This person has a lot of guns. They have a lot of mental issues, but they haven't shot up a school yet. Can we try to help them? Yeah. And, Right. You know, yeah, we immediately and, and so like what you were saying, like there's I always talk about like the smoke screen, like you look at all the racial stuff that goes on. The media only wants to mm-hmm. portray all this shit like black and white people don't get along. But in general, black and white people get along all the time. It's just that's not something you can sell in a blog or in an article. And so we have to keep keeping each other by divided by going, oh, what's going on over there? Oh, yeah, they're nothing like us and this and that. And it's like, yeah, OK, whatever. But you know how similar we really are? I remember having an argument with a bunch of guys in, in, you know, I live in a predominantly white area now and I lived in Philly. So for a while, but now I live in a more predominantly white area and I was arguing with all these guys on how similar country music and rap music was. And these are all these diehard country <laughs> guys. And I'm like, do you understand how stupid your argument is? Like you, you get it that like you both like trucks. They just like escalades. You like F one fifties. You both like weed. You both like guns. You both like women. It's just maybe the color the, the color of the woman is a little different. Whatever. But in general, you both like the same shit. The, the, it's just there, there's a little twang to yours and there's a little hood to theirs. But overall, it's the same thing. You guys just don't want to realize it. And I would have the same conversation with black people about it on, you know, hey, country music is just like your music. You just think their music is shit. But overall, it's very similar. It's just we have all these things in the middle that keep us so again segregated just in a different way now mm. you know it's not the black and white you know bathrooms and, and and all that it's just we do it now to ourselves we segregate ourselves because the one thing that people don't want even back to what we were saying originally about the disabled people and all the difference of people in the community 
if we actually just realized how similar we were to other people and trying to, we're trying so hard to be different and there's no one like us and all this other shit. It's like, no, we just need to have real conversations. And yes, we may not agree with everything someone says. I may hear a, a you know, a black Panther say how shitty white people are. I still want to hear how he mm-hmm. got to that conclusion. I still want to hear why he hates me. Yeah, I don't, I don't agree mm-hmm. with anything the Klan or any of these, you know, radical people towards gay people or people with disabilities. Or I just want to know how we get to that so that we can rec- so we can correct these things and so that we can be better people. But we can't if we don't mm-hmm. have the conversations and we don't realize that our neighbors, who we we just despise you know, are not that far off from us because the reality is we're one, right. we're one incident in a way or, or just certain hardships away from being, you know, again, I could have been a school shooter. I could have been a molester. I could have been uh, any of these things because of the experiences that were put on me. Um, and yeah, you know, yeah, but grace go I. Yeah. And if I didn't, yep, if I didn't have true. an eye problem, I might hate people with disabilities. I might discriminate against them. I don't know. I can't say I would or wouldn't, but I might just be a complete asshole yeah. to people with disabilities because I'm a fully sighted person running around and my life was privileged, but that, that wasn't the route my life took. So I can have open conversations. But again, I also think a lot of the things that you and I have within us are things you can't buy. And these aren't things that you can just manifest out of nowhere. Like to be a strong person, there's not a lot of strong people in the world. There, there's a decent amount, but you don't just wake up strong. You don't just wake up, you know, uh, kind and you know, there's a lot of things that some people just have regardless of the circumstances that have been put on them and, and just the things that just have plagued their lives they, they still somehow push through it um, even if they're not always themselves yeah. but they have these qualities that you just can't you just can't you know appear uh, and just like I said you can't you can't buy them because they're invisible and they're things that just you were born with I agree with you. And also, this is one of those two-sided coins as well, because although I I agree with what you're saying about our circumstances can radically change our perspectives and our choices, on the other hand, so often circumstances bring out what is really deeply in us in the first place. A metaphor that I've heard before is that the same sun that cracks or that hardens clay, right? Or the same heat that hardens clay melts wax, right? And the difference is not the heat. It was the same circumstance. The difference is the substance of what was exposed to that circumstance. You know, you can have 10 people go through the exact same thing thing at the exact same time, you know, be in the same spot when the, when a certain traumatic thing Mm happens. And those 10 people can take that experience and based on the thoughts that they have about it and the, and the beliefs that they bring to it, right. And the, and the actions that they take as a result of it come out 10 completely different ways. Right. You know, and that's, that's, that's huge to me is that, that idea, I know it's become cliche to say that, um, you know, life is nine is, um, 10% what happens to you and, and 90% how you react to it. But I really, I really, I have seen that truth in my own life and in the lives around me and, and growth through growth in my life. You know, I, there are ways that I used to respond to certain things that I choose to respond differently now but I think choose to is the really operative part of that sentence because so many of us operate our entire lives on complete autopilot right and we just you know something happens and it's a trigger and something goes off and we don't back up enough you know to get to to observe what's happening within us and what we're choosing you know how we're choosing to process that thing Right. Um, and perceive it and and respond to it, and so we're reactionary rather than um, responsive. And and then you know we're really just we're like pinballs, you know, in a pinball machine in life, and that's that's really crazy making. Right. I mean, I, yeah. And damaging. It damages yeah. us and others. Yeah, I guess I think it's the same argument for the people that, like I said, if something hits someone ten different times, even if you go back to like if I use sports as an analogy, like you see a guy, they always talk about guys who are the greatest or the ones who are the most clutch, the ones that can get past the moment. And these are things that no matter how physically gifted, there's players that are physically more gifted than these other guys, but mentally they, mm-hmm. they just had something that no one else had. 
And I think like, you know, yeah, if something lands on someone, 10 different, 10 different people, it's going to go 10 different ways, but there's certain ways that people go about it. Uh, they just had a quality in them that yes, maybe that would have never came out if that circumstance that never happened, but it was always within them. It's just, it took something to get it out of them. Um, but they had it there nonetheless, whereas the other nine or the other eight didn't have it and they did go a different route, good or bad, but they just didn't have that extra quality that made it just, it just, it brought it out even more, uh, and, and more Mm -hmm. to the, the forefront and actually made it, you know, just, you know, like I said, change their lives. Like I said, I just feel like some qualities and, and people, some people have certain qualities that you just, you may be able to adapt. Maybe some people really can adapt things later in life. And, and, but I do think some people are just born with certain things. Like I, I, you know, I interviewed a woman who's a, a disabled advocate. She's not, she doesn't have a disability at all, but she met a person who had, uh, like a deformity with her nose and, and mm-hmm. she got made fun of all the time. And she just, she was the one girl that sat down at her table and hung out with her and realized she was a good person yeah. and she wanted to be her friend. And that's not the norm. That's just something that right. she was just, she was just born kind. Like that's just something. And again, that sounds weird because, you know, I think I, I, you know, we all don't make the greatest decisions and so on, but there's not a lot of people that do that. We'll just sit down and actually sit next to the, the outcast because most people are just right. like, especially in school when you're in, you know, you're most impressionable and it's like, oh God, I can't be with the nerd or the ugly kid or whatever. Mm-hmm. But someone like that who clearly, and she was, she's also a beautiful girl, so she can fit in with the beautiful girl. She could literally do whatever she wants. She doesn't have to sit next to this girl with this deformity. She could just go, oh, okay, I do feel for her, but I'm not going to put myself out there like that. I'm going to eat lunch with all the cool kids. Um, mm-hmm. So like I said, I think there's just certain qualities like that where it's just like, yes, they you know, they, they just had it. You may be able to develop it, but that's personally, you know, certain qualities, like I think you have and some that I have, like, I just think I was just naturally born with it. It's just yeah. circumstances. What a blessing. Yeah. Circumstances just brought it to the forefront and made me realize like, okay, you know, like I, I didn't yeah. know my passion was to help people with disabilities. Like I, I could barely for a long time, didn't really come to terms with my own and hated myself right. and, and, and was embarrassed about, you know, being visually impaired. And now I could give a shit less and I just want to help other people regardless of how much time I have left in this life. So, you know, nearly dying twice. You, you just... know what though? I have, have you ever noticed like back in school that the teachers who have always been really good at something and always, un- and always understood it are the worst at conveying those things to other people. And it's the ones who really struggled with it that know how to teach it to other people who are struggling with it. You yeah, know what I mean? For the most part, like yeah. there are certain things I was just born knowing, or, you know, doing very well. And I really stink at teaching them because it's like, I mean, for me, those things are like breathing, but right. the things that I had to cultivate and, the, you know, the, and really earn and really learn are the things that's where the power of, of, of spreading a, a new kind of message to other people comes from. So it's two different kinds of strengths. There are right, those right. intrinsic ones. And they're those learned ones. But, you know, with the learned ones, it really requires willingness and some humility. And something that I needed to learn um, is that there are a lot of people, and I have been this person many times in my life. I'm not just pointing fingers. There are a lot of people who, although they're constantly whining about their circumstances, they really don't have any willingness or desire deep down to change it. And they will deny that until they're blue in the face. But something that I have learned is that if you continue to perpetuate something um, that is, that you're complaining about, right. That's hurting you or that's bringing about bad things in your life, you are getting something out of it. And until we can, admit to ourselves that we're actually gaining something from not changing, we're not going to have the willingness to change. So like a big example for me in my life is that I painted myself as this victim for entirely as a victim for a long time, which in many ways was true. I mean, when you're a child and certain things are perpetrated upon your body or your soul, you know, I mean, that's, that's a victim thing, right? But It created this ongoing, well into adulthood victim mentality. And the thing that I didn't realize for the longest time, the thing that was serving me about maintaining that perspective is that by blaming other people 
and by blaming circumstances out of my control for my own personal misery, I was letting myself off the hook of responsibility for right. doing anything productive right. in my life, right? right it right. excused my, my self-abusive behaviors. It excused my laziness. It excused all kinds of things right. in my life. It was an excuse. Blaming is an excuse that will keep you from the responsibility of doing anything worthwhile. And until I could come to terms with that, I did not have the willingness to cultivate different thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors. You know what I mean? Yeah. My teacher, Ms. Johnson, she once said, she said, just don't let anyone run space in your head. And Mm -hmm. it always stuck with me because it's just like, yeah, you just continue to let, you know, people bother you and you let little things that other people are doing and you're worrying about other ones, someone else's success and, and all this other stuff. And again, there's some, you know, human nature is what it is. You know, we all want things that other people have, even if it's not someone, you know, it's just like, Oh, I look that beautiful girl, a guy, you're like, I want that person, but you can't ever have them, whatever. There's things we always envy and we always want and whatever it's, it's you know, it's human nature, but you just can't let it linger. You can't let it stay there to the point where it just, it keeps you from being productive because you're just going to sit there and you're right. just going to constantly wait for something, you know, like even just back to the whole dating. It's like, yeah, I'm lonely. I'd love to find a decent girl in my life. But I also know, you know, by just bitching about all the other people that are happy, it's not going to, you know, no girl's going to be turned on by the idea of, oh, it's just this angry guy who just is mad that all the pretty girls went to the, the you know, the, the shitty guys or whatever. Um, and I also know, you know, just some bullshit belief of, oh yeah, the, the cookie, you know, some girl's going to try to sell me cookies and then we're just going to, we're going to lock eyes and we're going to fall in love. Like you have to go out and you got to go out and earn shit. You got to go fight for things. And life has never That's been easy for me. <laughs> right. Yeah. Life has never been easy yeah. for me. So like, I know I have to, or I have to go out and fight for it. I have to go out and get what I want. It doesn't mean take it by force. Yeah. It just means go out and actually put yourself out there and you got to, you got to come out your comfort zone. You got to go do things you don't want to normally want to do. Like I never was a speaker right. and I hated motivational, not motivational speaking, but I hated the idea of, I remember for, for three and a half years, I worried about doing the senior project in high school because I knew I had to present it in front of the school or in front of my class for, th- for three and a half years. I worried about it, even though I did other presentations right. before that, but for three and a half years, I was so worried about it. And then I did it and I got like a 98 or whatever it was. I got on it. It was a very high grade and it went really well. And when it was over, it was like, wow, that was three and a half years off my chest. Like I worried about that for yeah. so long and it was so simple. Um, yeah. And so like, I was never a leader. I was, I was always the person that just wanted to, I never wanted to put my hand up. I never wanted to fight for people. It's just when I started to see people like me, being equated with me as is like as we weren't even the same or we weren't different we're the same person because we have a disability or because we have a vision problem or because like I didn't have my own individuality I wasn't Timothy or TJ I was just the guy just like that girl over there with the disability and I couldn't take that anymore and it just lit a fire under me and it was something that again I think I had all this time I just never knew how to bring it out and you know yeah and so yeah it's an inside job first and then our outside start to reflect our inside. That's why I follow integrity with intention. You know, first we have to come to terms and peace and joy about who we are. And then we align outer, you know, in our outer world about what that is. And that brings me back to what I was saying in the beginning about the difference between acceptance and resignation. You know, there may be certain challenges in my life that I would prefer not to have, you know, but I have a choice between between accepting it as a factor that I need to think about as I'm making decisions, mm-hmm. you know, or I can wallow in self-pity about those things and never take any kind of action at all. And I don't mean to say, I, I need to clarify this a lot recently, that I don't mean to say that we should not allow those stages of grief, uh, particularly when it comes to things like, you know, diagnoses that are lifelong or, you know, whatever. But there's a difference between allowing the feelings to be felt and to pass through us and to go through those stages and pitching a tent in that dark place and living there for the rest of your life. And that's a really important balance. Um, I actually have talked about that a couple times recently. And I have a, a weekly column um, in uh, Authenticity Mags online 
um, called uh, Sarah's Inbox to go along with my, you know, ins, where people ask me questions largely related to authenticity. But where we say, you know, what do I do, you know, when my when my insides don't match my outsides or when if I were to make my insides match my outsides public that people would reject me or, you know, all those things are part of that process. But it, it really needs to start with. I don't want to say ruthless because being mean to ourselves is not productive, but with rigorous honesty, you know, about ourselves. And um, again, you know, trusting the perspective of people who know us well and whom we respect, not just whom we're desperate for their approval. That's a completely different thing. <laughs> but people whose, whose lives and philosophies we respect and, and would be honored to emulate. Right. You know, if we can look at, you know, what is really happening here, you know, and it, does that really align with who I'd like to be and who I'm designed to be and how can I change how can I pivot how I think and how I believe and how I behave to more clearly reflect my my highest potential um, mm-hmm. as a human being? And I don't just mean in what you can accomplish, like on paper. Mm-hmm. I mean just in your being, you know, even when you're alone by yourself. Yeah. And I think that's what you're talking about, about when you can really become your highest self then you become, even though you maybe would like to have something different, like you'd like to have a romantic partner, when you're really truly at peace with who you are, you make space for the most beautiful relationship to develop when it's time because you're going to attract a completely different kind of woman, right, when you're feeling desperate and needy and lonely and not good enough without a woman or when you're feeling expansive and like, being with you would be as much of a gift to the other person as vice versa, right? Right, right? And that's a that's a completely different mindset that sets you up for a completely different set of circumstances. Yeah, every I think everything you go through, you have to have a certain amount of balance. Like, there's nothing wrong with having like a killer instinct of just like a determination of like I'm going to get this done no matter what. But then there's also the part of it where mm-hmm. you're just like, well, there has to be a what because. That's how you step on people's toes. That's how you step on people to get to where you want. So you got to like, you know, not right. to, not to make this the sports podcast, but even just like how people talk about like Kobe Bryant, where it's like he had this killer instinct of wanting to win so bad that he kind of was a shitty teammate. Like all he wanted to mm. do was win that he didn't really kind of appreciate the people who actually helped him get to where he got to, at least for the majority mm, of his that's career. Huge. Yeah. So it's like burning bridges. Right. And so, and I've always been about unity and trying to get people here, but there's a part, you know, there is a time where you need to be selfish. You have to take care of yourself and you have to, you can't always think about everyone else. And a lot of times I don't leave room for, for myself. I'm always about what other people are doing because making other people happy and knowing all my friends and the people I care about are happy makes me happy. But if you don't take time to kind of wallow in your filth and just go like, okay, this is really sad. This is really like if, if someone dies and you become so desensitized to just whatever that's been going on, you know, or death or whatever has been happening in your life that you can't even cry or you can't even really, you know, kind of take the energy and put it to some sadness or some anger. Like then you got to realize there's a problem. Mm -hmm. You can't just be smiling when, you know, something terrible happens. So you have to have a balance. Acknowledging it. Being selfish is okay because that's human nature. We're all a little selfish. It's just, you got to put it in the right areas and not, you know, you right. Well, self care is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And this leads to, you know, another thing that I write about a lot is about the the crazy making um, scenario of constantly being attached to outcomes. You know, like I'm only worth something if I make another person happy, or what I did was only good if other people respond to it in this way. And I write a lot about the difference between goals, you know, like big picture, long-term goals and intention, which means today or in this moment, what is the next right thing to do? Because you don't know from day to day, if you're so fixed on a particular outcome, especially if that outcome hinges on things completely out of your control, like other people's perception of what you've done, right? Or paying for what you've created or whatever, you may never get there. And you may miss detours that would have led you to something even better along the way, right? So if I can just focus on today, right now, what is the highest 
best, most healthy, most productive, most aligned thing that I can do today, then whenever opportunities come up, I will be in a position to hit the ground running because I've already been doing that work and I've already been creating things and I already have something to show. And it opens up possibilities for an incredible number of things to to come out of it than the one thing that you had an iron grip on that may or may not happen. I actually recently heard this being talked about in a podcast and I wish I could remember which one it was, but they were talking about a study with Navy SEALs and they were talking about which ones are successful at getting through what they call hell week and which ones aren't. And they interviewed these guys afterward and about their mindset during hell week and, and what happened and what they found is that the guys who were thinking about, I have to get through this entire basic training thing before I can be a Navy SEAL. And, oh, my gosh, I have to get through seven more days of this awfulness or whatever. Those were the guys who failed and dropped out, right? Mm. And the guys, so apparently, even though they only get to eat once a week, I mean, to sleep, sorry, to sleep once a week for just a few hours in the middle of that hell week, they have to be fed every, I think it was six hours. And the guys who succeeded were the guys that just told themselves, I only have to get to the next meal and then I can sit down and I can regroup and then I can, and then the next meal and then the next meal. So the guys who had this big overwhelming goal would freak out and go, there's no way I can do this whole thing. It's kind of like alcoholics or other people in recovery, right? If you think about in early recovery about, I can never have another drink again for the rest of my life. That's overwhelming. Right. Nobody's going to make that. But if you think, I'm not going to drink today, or I'm not going to drink for the next hour, well, then days accumulate into months, accumulate into years, accumulate into your life, right? Mm-hmm. So it's that, it's that really critical difference between goals and intention that, you know, in, instead of, um, I have a goal of writing a best-selling book. Well, so much about that is completely out of my control, Right. But if I can intend to sit down and write for an hour every day, there's a really good chance that I'm going to come up eventually with something of quality that may do well in the market. Right. Right. And it's not all about like, yeah. And a lot of times it's it's not like, I think people automatically, because it's a lot of times it comes down to how bad do you want something? And it's not all about the execution. It's just, sometimes it's just effort. So it's like, I I may Mm. be frustrating with like, Oh, it's getting hard to find, you know, uh, you know, more people to listen. And it's like, okay, yes, it is hard. But if I don't do the podcast at all and I just stop trying and I stop reaching out to people and I stop trying to get on to other podcasts and so on and so on, if I stop making an actual effort, it's going to be even harder. There's no, it's not most right. likely an audience isn't just going to appear. Like if I just stopped doing it for a year and then all of a sudden it just, you know, maybe, maybe a link gets clicked on by somebody famous and they go, this was impactful. And then it goes out to the world. But we can't prepare for that. So you just got to continue right. to put an effort out. So even if the, even if you're, you know, what, what you intended to execute isn't really necessarily happening, you continue to, you know, run into these locked doors or whatever, there's still maybe a door down the road that's unlocked. You just got to continue to, you know, continue to reach for the doorknob and see if they open. And yeah. you, you got to keep trying. And if you don't try, it's most likely not going to happen. So sitting around yeah. and just going like, oh, well, it won't happen. Yeah, it sucks. It, we all go through that. We all get our setbacks, and it, it kind of goes back to what I always talk about with like quicksand. People talk about the you know the quicksand theory, but it's it's you know yes, if you you know a lot of times if you continue to reach for that stick, it's going to continue to pull you further down. But sometimes mm. you just got to take little spurts, and at some point maybe now you're taking two steps forward and one step backwards instead of the reverse, and then eventually maybe it's three and one, and then maybe it's four and then one, and then you get to a point where it's like oh. Quicksand is mm-hmm. miles away. Like you, you're, you're so to the point where now you're so far ahead and you've strived so much that you just, you've succeeded. And it's just maybe not the intend destination you, you know, planned on landing on. Because again, I never thought I'd be where I'm at right now, a year in doing this. And I didn't even think I'd even do this for a year because I usually give up on myself. So, um, but yeah, like I said, it, I think that's part of, it's the repetition part is the, it's the kind of getting yourself out there and actually you got to realize that you're going to, run into a bunch of speed bumps you're not going to always get what you wanted on the first try like i I've, I've gotten a lot of success and, and luck with with my guests 
But, you know, there's plenty of people that said, no, I shouldn't say said no, but a lot of people just didn't even respond and all that. And, you know, even just like I said, what we were talking earlier about just being disabled and trying to get a job or, or getting out in the work or, go, you know, going to school, and all, you're going to get a lot of people telling you no. And if you expect to just say, you know, oh, OK, I got off my ass this time and they're going to say yes. And then you sit, get no and then you're right. so determined, you get so deterred from that, that that one no just ruined your whole outlook. You can't. You have to really continue you have to realize denial is going to happen and rejection and that could right so yeah you just got to keep pushing and again like i said if you don't put yourself out there you don't try and you don't keep putting you know taking yourself out of the comfort zone and continue to uh do the things that you weren't accustomed to eventually that you will be accustomed to it but if you don't then you're going to be stuck in the oh you know I have no self worth, and oh, no one likes me, and I'm ugly, or or whatever the hell people go through. Right, right, right. Well, and here's a huge magical paradox, which you just now touched on, is that if I base my worth, my personal worth, or the worth of my work, on how it is received outside of me, that's going to be, you know, I, I'm never going to feel worth much. Or if I do, it's going to be really shaky and anybody can pull that out from under me. Right. But if I just keep doing what I'm called to do, I'm going to learn to know and like and trust myself more and even realize that the original goals I might have had were far too small, you know, compared to what I'm capable of. But it takes shifting your perspective about yourself. This is why um, a big change happened in my life when I stopped seeing myself as a healer and I, I shift from a goal of healing to, uh, as in healing others, to a goal of inspiring. Because what happened mm -hmm. when I was doing different kinds of work, perceiving myself and, um, and presenting myself as a healer was that I was attracting all kinds of different people and situations that were sick and expected me to make it better without mm. any effort or change on their own, right? right? And that was very frustrating for me and for them. But when I absolved myself of the responsibility of any kind of outcome outside of myself, and I said, all I'm going to do is my own work, and I'm going to do that work transparently and humbly and openly, immediately what started happening is that the people who were also hurting but who were ready to do their own work started showing up and listening to what I had to say and watching what I'm doing and healing themselves, right? When I just did my stuff and I said, this is how I'm doing it, take it or leave it as an example, you know, for what you want to do, then healing was happening as a result of what I was doing, right? In far better ways than when I was trying to force healing onto other people who right. really weren't ready to do the work. Right. Yeah. And again, and, right. and they say, you yeah. know, you, the energy you get back is the energy you put in. And again, mm -hmm. uh, you, you could believe that or not or whatever, but Again, if you just constantly put out negative energy, yeah, most likely people aren't probably going to like you. I mean, maybe you'll get some people that gravitate towards you. Like I always talk about two things I don't talk about here is politics and religion. Well, one of the especially politics, because, again, if I get on here and go, yeah, I love Trump. Guess what? I'm going to get a lot of fans that I probably don't want. And this is not about because I don't vote. So this has nothing to do with that. But, you know, I, I got one comment, one, one negative comment one time just about when I was doing like my year interview or just about how, you know, I, I, the whole purpose of the podcast was just okay I started my podcast this year and I felt like this is the year I learned a lot about you know myself and humanity I'm like how we should have mm -hmm. stuck together but everyone decided to make domestic violence go up and the crime rate go up and child abuse and all these things went up and instead you know I went and reached out to people and I tried to reach not just like podcast wise but just like all the people that I came across some teachers that I still had their numbers or their Facebooks and I just made sure everyone was doing okay and, you know, and I, I talked about, you know, of course, the debates and a lot of stuff that happened, but I didn't I didn't throw any political views. I said that I didn't vote. And one person said, oh, you must be a conservative, blah, 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 because you didn't shit on Trump enough. And it's like, I don't you know, again, it's about putting out good energy. I don't care about what people think of me, but I try to put out good energy. I try to get let people sh tell their stories, because, again, at the end of the day, I don't have to talk about disabilities at all. I don't have to talk about any disability other than my own. I don't have to. I can just get on here and just rant about myself. But in, at the end of the day, 
I want other people to shine because that's part of our problem is we don't, we don't even just in humanity, but also just as in the disabled community, we're so about ourselves and trying to solve, crack the problem for ourselves, but we don't look at, you know, Oh, when we succeed, what about the rest of the community? Because people mm-hmm. automatically don't think we exist. These anomalies, these unicorns of people who, you know, Oh, you're what you're, you're blind. And you, you know, my friend's blind. He, he uses a drill and a saw and he puts all these things together. He made my shoe rack and he does mm-hmm. all these. Oh, that doesn't exist. Oh, well, okay. Okay, fine. He exists, but there's no one else. It's like, no, that's bullshit. Right. But again, if I succeed and I'm like, oh, he's this outspoken guy who's fighting for all this. Oh, he must be the anomaly. No, I'm showing you all these people that are here with me. They are all the, you know, I have all these great guests coming up who have all these disabilities that can easily, they could just say, screw it. My life sucks. I can't do this. I don't want to, I want to be here. I don't want to put my story out there. I don't want to help anybody because I can't even help myself, but they do. And you know, I'm 50 some episodes in and I don't know, 34, 40 some guests, you know, that there's, there's a huge, amazing, right. So you can't, I'm not, I don't want people to think it's just them. So, or just me. Right. Um, And so, like I said, you got to put out, and you called it selfishness earlier, but I mean, you're proving the point that that's not what it is by what you're saying right now, your friend who's a carpenter and the work that you're doing and so many other people by do practicing self-awareness and self-care and humility enough to be transparent about successes and failures, you know, and bringing forward and setbacks in their lives, your personal work and focus becomes incredibly a, a generous gift to the world rather than just sitting there and saying, do what I say, not what I do, you know, and just saying how things should be. And, you know, like the guy eating the pork rinds, yelling at the football player, right? That by us practicing self-care and self-awareness and continuing to hold ourselves to high standards with grace and a sense of humor and being honest about that, that is more empowering and life and even world changing outside of us than anything else. So I don't think that's selfish at all. It may feel like it in the moment, but ultimately it's an incredible gift. And I'm really grateful for the work that you and others like us are doing. Yeah, because we need it. It's, you know, there, again, I've said this so many times that like, I feel like, you know, if I ever gave up, it's like, and it's not me specifically, but if I gave up, it's like gaining 10 of us because there's so few of us doing it that when we actually mm. lose one of us in the fight, it really impacts us more than if it, we were mm. to just gain one person. Because one person, it's great, but it's just not enough. We need more to, you know, and I always, but I also, like I said, I can put myself in other people's shoes. I'm so open-minded. Like, I understand why a lot of us don't want to come out because there is a lot of embarrassment. There mm-hmm. is a lot of shame. And right. there's a lot of things that you have to come to terms with yourself and realize that you're putting yourself yeah. out to the public where the public now knows that you have a disability, whereas maybe, you know, only your community or whatever. Um, and you have to talk about your mental health. You have to talk about all these things that really maybe are embarrassing to you. And I I get it because I was embarrassed by it for a long time too. I I didn't want to talk about my suicide attempt. I didn't want to talk about, you know, dealing with depression on a daily basis and, 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 you know, feeling just crazy because some days I feel good about myself and some days I just want to slip my wrist because I'm just, I feel ugly and I feel whatever. And then, you know, and then just being an advocate for people with disabilities and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm doing all this good work, but it's like, man, like I, I make sure people know, like, especially on Instagram and stuff, I put out messages where I'm just like, look, I want people to know, I don't feel that great about myself. I don't, I don't want to sit here and act like my depression doesn't consume me right. once in a while because I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not sitting here looking right. down at anyone who's going through this stuff because as a person who's maybe a little further ahead than some people, uh, you know, and mindset wise or at a point in my life where I can, can be as honest as I am with myself I realize that, you know, some people may look at it like, oh, well, well, he may think he's too good for this. It's like, no, I'm still struggling. I right. will probably never not struggle with this, but I'm just right. telling you I'm on a better place now. And, and, you know, again, like I said, it's about putting out the good energy. Which is hope. It's giving hope. This is why I'm working behind the scenes right now on, on uh, bigger works about resentment and shame. I was not able to start doing the work that I'm doing now, or at least as effectively as I'm doing now until I really deeply addressed my own issues of resentment and shame. And the difference between guilt and shame is guilt is I did something I shouldn't have done. And shame is 
therefore I'm a bad person, right? right? And I had a lot of shame before and I was so afraid that if I became more, um, if I got more public attention, that people from my past would publicly call me out on things that I regret having done, right? And I, and the idea of that was devastating to me. And I had to come to a place where I feel willing, I mean, it's not like I'm excited about it, but if those things were to come up, I feel willing to own up to them and to make whatever kinds of amends that I'm, I'm allowed to make and that I'm capable of making without it translating in my mind to I'm a, I'm a worthless human being and I don't have anything of quality to offer the world, right. you know? And also uh, those pieces of shame aren't just about things that we've done, but about things that have been done to us, either just cosmically, like I was born without any limbs, or, you know, I was beaten every day as a child or, you know, whatever it is, you know, that when we that we can have shame and say, um, like it's something I believed for so many years and it just ate me from the inside out was because I was treated unlovingly, it means that I am unlovable. And I, I carry deep shame about that. And I behaved in a way that proved that point to myself on a daily basis. I treated myself as an unlovable person and that leaked out and hurt other people around me too. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, before we can really be willing and able to do this public sort of work, we really do need to do at least some of the private work and be willing to continue to do it on an ongoing basis so that when hiccups do happen or things, you know, go from the past come back to haunt us. We're not completely derailed as human beings and our work isn't nullified. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, again, it, it, someone tells you something enough, you know, you even see it in a good way. You, you see guys that are like overly confident because 10 girls told him that he's cute. So he gets it in his head. He gets mm. big headed and goes, Oh, I'm cute. You know, but it, it can definitely impact you the other way and more so most likely. Right. Um, you know, yeah, if something has told you, you know, you're a whore, you're ugly, you're th- whatever, you, all these horrible things that people right. are told, they're probably going to go reenact it because it's like, well, I guess I am this thing. Um, but right. I think what's amazing about you is like, you know, again, I, I guess it looks like all of our conversations are just going to be long, but <laughs> we had a long conversation <laughs> uh, a couple days ago. And, you know, at the end, you were saying you had to go because you had all this, you know, chronic pain and, and all the things you're going through. And, and, you know, of course, I felt bad for you, but yeah. you say it like it's just so matter of fact, like you still sound happy. You still sound like a person. Again, I'm sure, sure. You, you go through every, you know, you go through your moments and whatever, as we all do. But you still sound like a person who just, in, you know, loves her life and still wants to be alive and still yeah. wants to make progress and do all these things. Whereas, you know, if if you probably ran, if you didn't know you and didn't hear your voice and all that, and you just read your whole bio of everything you've been through, if mm. everything was on some sheet, you would think you right. would probably be a person who just would hate life and be angry and sad and all these things. But you still have gotten to the point where you're just, like I said, you, you sound like a nice person. You sound happy. You sound like a, and again, you, you get it from oh, your, I have them fooled. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. well, you know, that really comes back to the not qualifying things. You know, they're. The question is, I think a huge question to ask yourself is what is your therefore in your mind? We usually don't say the therefore out loud, but I could have said the other day, right, like um, I, I'm in pain um, and, you know, therefore I'm, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm worthless, I'm, you know, I shouldn't have done this, I'm, I'm incapable of doing things, you know, whatever. I could have all that or like I meant the other day, I'm in pain, therefore this is a good time to stop and let me practice some self-care. You know, and the first one is a qualifying statement, right? Therefore, you know, I'm a bad person or my life is bad in some way, right? Where the second therefore is like I was talking about, like a scientist, you know, therefore, you know, this is the the thing that should be applied to the situation in, in that case with rest and medicine, right? And that can be really, really freeing when, when we can start to make um, our perceptions and our decisions revolve around um, what is practical rather than what is um, uh, a judgment. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I, like I said, my whole yeah. thing was just that, you know, in a moment where 
you know, like I said, I felt, I really felt for you because you're just like, oh, I gotta, you know, I'm in a lot of pain. I just want to go relax and do, and it's just like, but you, you didn't say it like you had any shame or there's anything wrong with it. You just said it like, oh, yeah, no. like, this is something I do in my life. I just, I don't, I don't want to be sitting here talking. I just got to go relax. And it was just like, oh, like it, it was right. very, very humbling in a way. Cause it was yeah. just, just like, okay, like it's just, it's, it's nice. Like there's nothing about it that you, it's just, it's something you just own. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure it, it sucks. You probably. Well, it's also a way of respecting you and your time. If I'm in so much pain that all I can do is think about the pain that I'm in, we're not going to have a quality conversation. I'm not going to really hear and care about what you have to say. And I'm not going to have much to contribute. Right. Mm-hmm. So self care is also putting us in a position to care better for others. Right, yeah. And again, it's inspiration. If it's okay, me to say, you know what, I've done enough today. I've been grateful to offer this, but now I need to take care of myself. That gives you inspiration and permission to do the same in your life. And that's something that's catching that will catch on to the next person you practice self-care in front of and so on and so on. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Sometimes so often, actually, I make it, I make and occasionally sell these things that are called permission slips. Um, and they're literally like, you have permission to take a nap. <laughs> you have permission to, <laughs> you know, whatever, because so often we don't do things literally because no one's ever told us that it's okay to do. And we have this whole list of things in our heads that we think are like rules that really aren't. And, right. and, but they don't, sometimes it's really useful to verbalize them, which is why I literally write them down and give them to people like a little prescription from the doctor. But sometimes permission is given to observation. If she can do it, I can do it. You right. know, it seems to be working well for her. Maybe it'll work for me, right. you know, and, and that's just living your best life without an agenda. And yet having beautiful results just blossom around you as a result of you doing more work. Yeah, absolutely. Super cool. Um, yeah, Super I don't. Cool. I don't want to cut our conversation short, but this has already been two hours. So, um, well, that would yeah, that would have been a while ago. <laughs> yeah, no, but again, thank you for your time and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. I mean, we'll we'll have many conversations off the mic and whatever. And like I said, we're definitely going to be friends. And again, we could probably do another one down the road if you'd like, and you know, whatever subject matter sure. we want to go into. Um, but before we do go, is there anything you would like to promote as far as a book or a website or any anything? I don't care. Thank you. Um, the best way probably to keep in touch with my various um, projects and uh, also for links to like my social media and things is um, my website, which is sarahshalom.in. It's S-A-R-A. There's no H on my name. Then shalom, S-H-A-L-O-M as in Mary, um, dot in, I-N, and I, I didn't find out till later that that usually stands for India, but it made sense since most of what I talk about starts with the words I-N. Yeah, it does. So that yeah. has uh, more of an overview about the different things that I've done in my life as well as um, current projects. Yeah. Well, you... And it has links to like, you know, YouTube, Instagram. Um, on Facebook, I, I usually write um, Monday through Friday um, something inspirational, and I also generally have um, an advice column related to authenticity um, which is always um, linked to on my website and on Facebook. Yeah, all right, awesome. Um, well, like I said, we've talked maybe my uh, third conversation, so I do have a lot of love for you. I'm very happy what you're doing, and uh, thank you. Like said, I'm happy to obviously finally get you on, and uh, like I said, we'll do another one down the road. But we'll obviously, obviously, keep in touch every you know so often, support each yep. other and what we're doing. And um, like I said, anything you need, just please reach out, and you know. Even if you just need someone to talk to, as I always say to people, if you need a friend, someone to talk to, please just text or call me. Thank you. It's been an honor. All right. Well, uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. All right, guys. I know. Eh, quiet. Stop talking. Um, but, yeah, thanks for joining us on this journey. It was a very good conversation. I really didn't know where this one was going to go because we didn't talk a whole lot about her life. We just had a good conversation and and – these are conversations that need to be had. So uh, thank you guys. Please like, comment, subscribe. And uh, God, it's just so weird to feel like a podcaster because I hear all these people say these things. And I'm like, ah, I'm a, I guess I am one. You know, you just got to come to terms with it. I'm mean, a fucking podcaster. Um, but yeah, guys, um, I'll see you guys next week. And uh, everybody take care and, uh, you know, check on somebody. Just make sure they're all right. To somebody out there that... Uh, you know, you haven't heard from in a while or, you know, you haven't contacted with them, just someone, um, 
I got to go check on my aunt Tamiko. Uh, obviously, I've had her on the podcast, and I haven't talked to her in, in some months, and I got to make sure she's doing okay. Um, so that's my goal for the week, just to check on her and, and just a couple people. A couple people I know are getting surgeries and stuff, so I'm just going to see how my mom just got hers and seems to be going okay, but she's in a lot of pain and all. So, um, But, yeah, just check on some people, okay? At least one person, maybe one a week. But, yeah, guys, uh, I'll see you guys next week, and uh, take care, guys.